Good evening. This is the call to worship. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face to shine upon us. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we do rejoice and give you praise this evening as we gather in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and ask you to grant your blessing to this gathering, that as we stand upon the firm foundation that is the Lord Jesus, grant, O oh God, that we may see the wonders of your grace, that we will leave here this evening rejoicing in that grace and proclaiming that grace even as we live in your grace. Bless us, we pray, for we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus, and everyone said together, Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue as we sing together, Rock of Ages.
And then finally, before our teacher comes, grace alone. song very well, but I have every confidence you know the subject matter good tonight, and I'm looking forward to that. May I offer a prayer for you this evening? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this dear servant that you have brought to be among us. Thank you, O Lord, that we have the privilege this evening of sitting and listening together to things that truly matter. O Father. Grant to our minds and hearts and understanding, even as we pray that you will grant to this your servant, unction of your Holy Spirit, that as he speaks, O oh Lord, we may be transformed by this glorious word of yours. Bless him, we pray, that we all may be blessed. To the praise of your glory, and in the name of Jesus we ask. hear me or maybe should I go through this yes I guess you're not you can hear it okay all right I think it's on it's a hot mic as they say all right yeah well we're continuing in our evening series this notion of God's attributes communicable and incommunicable as we diligently seek have a right understanding of who God is. And tonight, we're going to look at the particular attribute of grace. This is a communicable attribute of grace, called that because it's one that's shared with us. And it's one of his moral attributes along with mercy. I can think of no other doctrine, as I said earlier today, uh, than that of grace. And if possible, I thought to myself, I would like to preach on this topic for the rest of my calling, the rest of my years. It is 
sense I ever have breath left. It is truly that important. J. Gresham Machen tried to express the importance of this topic when he said this, the very center and core of the whole Bible is the doctrine of the grace of God. And I would add to that that indeed it is what would be called the controlling center of the Bible. Try to explain the Bible absent, absent the doctrine of grace and you can't do it. You may have just read in the news that somebody in California won a two billion, that's with a B, two billion dollar lottery ticket. One thing you need to know is that that ticket was sold in the town I grew up in, Altadena, <laughs> California. The second thing you need to know is it wasn't me. <laughs> but if you won, would you be excited? Be excited if you won two billion dollar lottery. Well, if you do, do you realize that, so to speak, you won a far, far greater lottery? We don't think of faith as a lottery, a lottery, but in terms of being and one of the elect, you have been selected for something infinitely more valuable. Dollars will mold; they'll they'll deteriorate. Or uh, as we so often read about in the news, they cause great harm to people. I, although I heard one wag say, if, if that kind of lottery, lottery makes you unhappy, you don't know where to shop. <laughs> you and I, on the other hand, were chosen, despite the fact that we don't remotely deserve it. And we were chosen for a destiny of eternal goodness and glory genuine riches, of an irrevocable promise of God's good care and protection, something, to use a phrase, well-worn phrase, that money can't buy. If you're truly a believer and you have been chosen and appointed for eternal glory, richness of which can never, ever be taken or stolen from you, Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 3, 8, says this, The doctrine of grace shall provide reason for praise, reverence, and admiration of God. And so praise we will tonight. So let's begin in prayer. Lord Jesus, with delight and yet with trembling, we approach this grand topic of grace, your grace. Lord, make clear the enormity of the gift you have given us. And let us with renewed insight and profound appreciation realize afresh the unfathomable price you paid for this gift, gift which you give so freely. Bless now our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn, if you will, to God's word with me. We're going to start in Ephesians, and we're going to go to the first chapter, right after Galatians. We're going to look at Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 11. Now have your phones, your Bibles, uh, however you, you read God's word handy, because we're going to look at a lot of scripture tonight. All right, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why did he do that? That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of, his, of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. You hear a common word through this, that's grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite.
unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Let's skip uh, forward a bit to Romans. Book of Romans, one of my favorite books in the Bible. And we'll look at chapter 9, verses, we'll start at verse 14. Romans chapter 9, starting at verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God, who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even to us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed, he says in Hosea, those who were not my people I will call my people. We're really now starting to touch on this whole concept, the real visceral meaning of grace. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons. very word of God given to you and I. May he use it to change our lives and to bless us. Well, let me start with the end in mind. God's grace is our hope realized. God's grace is our hope realized. Absent God's grace, we're morally dead with no chance ever under any circumstance, without exception, of salvation. Given this, can you think of a more important gift than that of grace? Let me define grace. Grace can be defined as God's kindness or goodness toward those who do not deserve it. In fact, who deserve only punishment. Two theologians spoke. So you think a graduation ceremony with one person is long enough. Rachel and I had two at our graduation. One of them was Dr. O. Palmer Robertson. Those of you who have come to the adult Sunday school class hear me talk about him a lot. And he defined this, he defined grace this way. And I think he nailed it in its real meaning. He said grace is dismerited favor dismerited favor. His point was to emphasize that God's kindness and mercy is given to those where the only thing deserved was punishment. And yet, they got the opposite. In other words, if we went just by pure justice, every one of us sitting in here would be condemned. No way out of it. So consider Romans 4. Verses 7 and 8. Blessed are, I mean, when you read this, try to even understand this absent the doctrine of grace. And I don't think you can. I can't. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So if you're a believer, you're blessed. You're blessed because of God's grace, whereby he will not count your sin against you. I feel, but I'm going to say this a variety of ways a number of times tonight because I think this is so important to grasp the concept and the enormity of grace. Grace is God's response in spite of our sin, our corruption, and our treason towards him. Not only does God forgive us, but he then liberates us from the tyranny of that sin and of death. So if you're a believer, again, it's because of God's grace. His favor and kindness was granted to you, even though none of us deserve it. 1 Peter 2.9 says, God called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Isn't that a great definition of grace? This is the incredible quality of God's grace. It is irresistible, and we'll come back to what that means in a minute, coupled with his effectual calling, you and me. John 6, makes this clear. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws or calls him. In fact, we are recipients, John says in chapter 1, verse 16, of grace upon grace. You and I are the recipients. If we're believers, we, the, we are the recipients of grace upon grace from God. One example of how important grace is by what means are you forgiven of your sin? Is it your repentance or God's grace? In Sunday school, I always talk about how I go ahead of the path a bit before you. I dig out a, uh, a little trench and I cover it over with branches so it looks like it hasn't been disturbed. I won't leave you in the pit, but... Is it because of your repentance or because of God's grace? The answer is yes, <laughs> as it often is in theology. It turns out that repentance is necessary, but by itself is not sufficient. That gives a whole new insight to this concept of grace. Repentance for sins is necessary, but absent God's grace, is insufficient. God draws us. He changes our hearts by his grace, the grace of regeneration. And he gives us faith and the desire to repent of our sins and to follow him. This forgiveness of sins by God is a free grace. And without this doctrine, without this gift of grace, none of us could be cleared of our sin and would be doomed to what we had earned. What have we earned by our works? Well, damnation. That's what the work of our hands alone leads to. Listen to Paul and to the prophet Hosea's teaching. And let's consider how God has worked, what they're saying in our lives. Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans, chapter 3 and verses 23 and 24, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's again marvelous. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching and people in our congregation are mouthing the very verse. This is fantastic. And are justified by his grace as a gift through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So what's God's response to our sin? What would your Well, Hosea 14.4 says this. This is God's response to the sin. I will heal their apostasy. I will freely love them, for my anger will have turned away. Colossians 1.13, he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Who receives grace? 
only believers, unbelievers, believers and unbelievers. I set up more than one little trap here. Who said, who said yes, Greg? Yeah. Amen. You got it. Surprisingly, an evidence of what we've just talked about regarding God is God gives a measure of his grace, that is his favor, his kindness, and his mercy to everyone. What we call common grace. Listen to Matthew 5, 45. For God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Or as one person has said, the dew drops on the thistle as well as the rose. Another form of grace is God's special or saving grace. This is God's grace given to his elect only. The, the writer of Hebrews instructs us in regards to this in this way. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Of course, only believers could do that. Only believers would do that. So how does Scripture speak of grace and mercy and its relation to the elect? Well, is this a concept found only in the New Testament? Or is it found in the Old, too? It's in both. Let's go back to Exodus 33. Exodus 33, verse 19, which, by the way, Paul quotes in Romans 9, 15. And he says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. In other words, not everyone. Only those he chooses. That's why I said, a bit of a crass way, is that you won the greatest lottery, lottery ever drawn. Listen to Psalm 103, verse, uh, starting at verse 8. Listen now for, for the tone, the melody of grace and mercy for those who are truly his. The Lord is merciful and gracious, Psalm 103, verse 8. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, I don't know which way that is, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Brothers and sisters, this is grace distilled. This is pure grace that that could be the case. But what about believers who sin? Do we have any of those present tonight? <laughs> Well, the man speaking to you is a believer who sins. Listen to this promise from 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 and verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while from the consequences of your sin, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, There's the price for sin. Does that mean we should sin all the more? Let's say it biblically. What was the response of Paul? By no means. Importantly, again, these are promises only for the elect. Those who reject Christ and do not receive this grace. They simply end up with justice. Get justice. You and I were removed from justice and given grace. I've often thought about it. I can't think of the name of the movie. It's kind of sacrilegious in a way, but uh, Morgan Freeman plays God. Did you ever see that movie? 
And I imagine, okay, so um, Greg Poland dies, and uh, it doesn't work this way theologically. But, but Jesus says, let's see, Greg Poland, Greg Poland. And there's this long building of file cabinets with one sin after another in their catalog. But Jesus walks into the room. What does he see? He doesn't see any of that. He doesn't see any of that. Imagine you had complete, you had, you had uh, uh, done a sin which deserved the death penalty you're sitting there and you know what the judge is going to say. The evidence is incontrovertible. And he pounds the hammer and he says, not guilty. I mean, you'd be stunned. And that's a sort of rudimentary picture of just how fantastic grace is. So how do we put all this together? One of the questions you might have is, so what? I've heard this since I was a kid in Sunday school. So I'm going to try to fill in now for the rest of my time the so what for this. Absent grace, as I said, we would receive only what we had deserved, only what we had earned. And that's punishment and death for our sins. Remember that there is nothing, absent being a believer, there is nothing you could do to atone. You can't work your way out of sin. You would be dead in the spirit. Again, Paul in, fifth, in Romans 5.15 answering, how do we get this grace? If many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to the many. So grace came to us the same way corruption one man. Corruption through the first Adam, grace through the second Adam. Romans 11, 5, 8, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. You are in a sense, a real sense, a remnant. But if it is by grace, it can no longer be on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that could not hear, down to this very day. So why do we say grace, then, is a free and unmerited gift? You now know the answer because Scripture proclaims it to be so. Absent grace, you and I would share in this spirit of stupor with eyes that don't see and ears that would not hear, leading to our spiritual death. With grace, you're spiritually revived and forgiven completely for your sins and will receive mercy and his eternal presence. This is the answer to the question, so what? So our very salvation is dependent upon God's grace. But I want to go a little bit further. Grace, we said, is a gift given to us by God that leads to our salvation. Grace is by faith. It's completely and totally dependent. cannot, even through the most extreme exertion of will or desire, earn this. When I was a young man in high school, through a series of mistakes, I became the president of our youth group. And I decided that, you know what, I, I got I to gotta really clean up my act, right? I've got to be better than I am right now. I've, I've got to be perfect because people are depending on me. Any guesses as to how long that lasted? <laughs> as soon as I thought I was going to be better than others, it was gone, right? But what if we had to earn God's grace and therefore earn our own salvation? Nothing could be done. 
it's not even remotely possible. It cannot be done. It has never been done by any human. No more than when you physically die. No matter how much, if you even still had a consciousness, could you summon up the will to become alive again? It is just as impossible. Listen again to Romans 11, 6. If it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Why am I emphasizing this? Why do I keep saying this? Why do I say I want to preach on this the rest of my, my calling? Because whether it's in my exam room, whether it's in the counseling room, whether it's praying with a friend, my own perception is this is the doctrine that is the hardest for people to grasp. And the reason for it, when you consider it, is it goes against the grain of fairness. I think it's because inside people say, it's not fair. I don't deserve this. And you'd be right. You don't deserve it. But that is the enormity. There's nobody here, and I don't know all of you that well, but just by age, there is nobody here that has not experienced, in many cases, unfathomable pain. Horrible things in every one of our lives. And in turn, we've done horrible things or said horrible things to other people. are regenerated, when we receive, when we repent and receive faith so that we can repent, we are working, in a sense, hand in hand with the Holy Spirit's work in us, not out of some sense of exerting to become better, but out of gratefulness for the grace we you a quick story. This is a colleague of mine, my family knows him, who became aware of a believer who lost both her kidneys. She had no kidney function. She was not doing well on dialysis. He found out about this, prayed about it, and he felt that he was called to give this woman who never met one of his kids. Before you can donate a kidney, Dr. Neil Turnip, you were interviewed by the psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist quizzed him over and over as to why he was doing this. And he finally said, sort of in exasperation, I don't know what to tell you other than when I look at the gift of life I've gotten, I feel called by my Savior to return that gift. This was a non-believing psychiatrist who wrote in the chart his concerns over this man's, quote, faith. But our friend went ahead and donated that kidney, and that woman lives till today. Now, what if that woman had been your daughter? somebody gave her one of their kidneys, what would your response be? I know what mine would be. And it's my attempt to try to give you a picture of what every one of you have received. But unlike a kidney that will stop working one day, the gift that you have received will never, ever stop working. It will never slow down. It will never break. 
It can never be taken away from you. In fact, there's nothing you can do to cause God to remove his grace from you. Listen to Romans 4.16. This promise of great grace depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace as opposed to the law and be guaranteed. Do you hear that strong word? Guaranteed to all his offspring. Do you ever stop to consider, and I'm tempted to do my Jonathan Edwards interpretation of his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Do you ever stop to think that your next breath, when you walk out of here, the only reason you will get home is by God's grace? We take that for granted. But try to imagine through your exertion, through your force of will, that you will take a breath tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. and that your heart will beat the way it's supposed to can't do it. Yes, you, as, you assume that because it's always happened that way, that it will continue that way. But that is an assumption. And my whole career has been treating people who came into my office with that assumption. Next, how can we be assured of God's grace? Can I be confident? After all, I fail over and over. God withdraw his grace from me? I want to read you language from our subordinate standard, the Westminster Confession of Faith. We are going to go through, the, after what we're going through in Sunday school, we're going to spend time going through every chapter of the Confession of Faith. It is, it is so beautifully written by men who had over 1,200 committee meetings hammer out man's interpretation of what God is saying to us in his word. Listen to 18.1. Those who truly believe on the Lord Jesus, love him sincerely, and strive to live in all good conscience, conscience before him, may in this life be certainly assured that they are in a state of grace and may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The second, this certainty is not merely conjectural and probable persuasion grounded on fallible hope, but an infallible assurance of faith founded on the divine truth of the promises of salvation, on the evidence in our heart that the promises of grace are evident beautifully written. I'm reading this to you because in, in every way I can think to approach you, which are, you are one of God's diamonds. I want you to see every facet of it so that you leave here assured in a way that maybe you never have been before. Uh, 3.5. Those people who were predestined to life, God, before the foundation of the world was laid, before you ever had a chance in your striving, according to his eternal and unchangeable purpose and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will, has chosen in Christ to everlasting glory. He chose you out of his free grace and love alone, not because he looked forward in time and foresaw that you would accept him or because of your good works or because of perseverance in any of those. He did this out of his free grace, all to the praise of his glorious grace. So you and I, brother and sister, are saved by God's grace. We were chosen as one out of the many. You might ask, where does this grace come from? We talked about Jesus, but let's look at John 1, 17. For the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There it is, clearly stated in plain words. Grace comes through Christ and Christ alone. We are justified by that grace. 
Is there any evidence of this gift? Consider that God gave us outward signs and seals of his covenant grace, what we call the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And we call it a covenant, like a treaty, a contract, because words and signs collectively compose a covenant or a contract. But above and beyond anything else, the sacraments were given to us as a continuing means of understanding God's grace. The Spirit delivers Christ and all of his benefits to us through the sign and seal of baptism and of the Lord's Supper. They are regular, visible reminders of the gift of grace you have received. And that's why this church takes them so seriously. And there can be only one response to that in my mind, and that's doxology. Take the reality of our very salvation. No one can be saved without being regenerated, simply because we're all dead in sin. But as reformed believers, we believe that God's grace is irresistible. And we believe that that grace is actually not potentially saving. I'm going to hammer a little bit on this because this is a point of, of confusion for many. And that it is not granted to every person. Grace, saving grace, is not granted to every person, but only to his elect. Ephesians 2, 1 through 8. Many of you know it by heart. When you were dead, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. This grace does not, as the Arminians contend, merely offer liberation from sin. Rather, it results in liberation from sin. You've heard the acronym TULIP, right? Has, has everybody heard that? Well, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, and the I stands for this notion of irresistible grace, and finally, perseverance of the saints. Did you ever wonder what makes it irresistible? What makes it irresistible? It means that despite our inborn resistance, our stubbornness, our rebellion and rejection of Christ, the Holy Spirit's purpose for those of us chosen cannot be thwarted. So the Spirit's work in us cannot be thwarted. It is irresistible. It is a grace, as R.C. Sproul says, that is invincible and will accomplish its purpose. Now, this is not a forcing of us to accept Christ against our will. Rather, we're made willing to come to Christ by his grace. Grace changes our cold, stony hearts toward Christ to one that comes alive and is responsive to him. And the fruit of this regeneration of our heart is belief in the things of God. Psalm 40, verse 2. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry block, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Who's that rock? Well, wait a minute, we're talking about the Old Testament here. Christ is there on every page of Scripture. One of our seminary professors says in every verse of Scripture. R.C. Sproul sort of summarized it this way. Grace, he said, should never cease to amaze us. God has an absolute, pure, holy standard of justice 
That's why we cling with all our might to the merit of Jesus Christ. He alone has the merit to satisfy the demands of God's justice, and he gives it to us freely. We haven't merited it. There's nothing in us that elicits the Lord's favor that leads to our justification. It's pure grace. I think when we understand that, again, the only thing we can do is be overcome with gratitude, and that leads to doxology. So let me summarize, meaning I've got three or four more pages. <laughs> the grace of God, as we summarize, has two outcomes for us, two gifts, if you will. One is the unmerited gift of God's divine favor in saving us as sinners. As I said before, God's grace is our hope realized. The second is the divine influence of God's constant grace operating in us and affecting our regeneration and our sanctification. Listen one more time to the beauty with which the Westminster Divines put it in chapter 32 of the Confession of Faith. And think about yourself. The bodies of men after death return, they said, to dust and see corruption. But their souls, which neither die nor sleep, having an immortal subsistence, immediately return to God, who gave them the souls of the righteous, being then made perfect in holiness, are received in the highest heavens, where they behold the very face of God. Do you realize that through the grace of God, you are one day going to look face to face with the God in whom you and I have put all of our hope. The souls of the wicked, those who are not elect, are cast into hell where they remain in torments and utter darkness reserved to the judgment of that great day. Well, the application for us, and I'm going to quickly summarize here. First and foremost, Grace is a profound gift and a mercy God gives to us who are completely and utterly undeserving. Second, our only response should be immense gratitude and faith in him who gives us a, gr a gift so great that it leads to salvation. Third, it is only by this grace that you and I are saved from eternal damnation. Fourth, we are now relieved. We are relieved of trying to earn the gift of grace and of earning our own salvation. It is a fool's errand and can never and has never been done. It is a gift. Fifth, the converse is also true. Those who reject Christ, who reject his gift, will spend eternity in the pits of hell with no escape and no way out. And it will happen in a blink of an eye and can never be reversed. Sixth, all of the above should lead to doxology. And lastly, grace liberates us from the tyranny of sin and of death. As John Calvin noted, everything good in us is entirely Lord Jesus, we have sought to understand this critical concept so clearly present in your word to us. Help us, Lord, to believe it, to apply it, to praise you, to tell others of your free gift of unmerited grace. Lord, given what we have learned, work in us to be bold in our witness and your saving word to others. We ask these things in Jesus' name.
so uh, as we finish tonight, I leave you to go into the world in the best hands and the strongest hands I can think of, and that is our Lord's. With this blessing, it composes the very last ten words of Scripture. Brothers and sisters, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Go now, each of you, into your m mission field, remembering that you live Coram Deo before the very face of a living God.